Welcome to STEM Unplugged, a monthly podcast designed to help you learn about STEM initiatives and to help advance STEM awareness. Now here's your host, Kelly Green. In this episode of STEM Unplugged, we will be exploring ways STEM rocks. And we have guests on, including Angie um, Harmon from Freeport McMoran, and we have also Molly Radway. Wani, Radwani. Radwani, yep. Uh, you're going to have to introduce it a little bit better than I just did. I'm so sorry. We have Julia Potter and Maria Bertram. So I would like to kick it over to Angie Harmon, talk a little bit about Freeport McMoran and a little bit about what your role is as the regional community development manager for North America. And then, you know, send it over to Molly and introduce why you invited them to be guests as well. Sure. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks for the introduction, and I'm glad to be here with everyone today. Um, as Kelly shared, my name is Angie Harmon, and I'm with Freeport Mac Moran. Um, we often have the name of our company. Um, it just looks a little different than it sounds, but it is Mac Moran. Um, the Mac, Mo, Mo, and Ran are for three people who were um, the founders of the company. And so um, it is Freeport MacMoran and we are a mining company. We're headquartered in Phoenix. We're an international company and um, have operations in North America, South America and Indonesia. And then exploration all over the place. Um, so a, a global company um, with our roots here in Arizona and in Phoenix and um, it definitely aligns with the, the topic for the podcast today of why STEM rocks, because we deal with rocks all the time. And um, really glad to be part of the company. Um, I, well, we have um, a great panel of women here today, and a couple of us are more technical STEM experts, and others of us just have the privilege of working for a company that um, rocks STEM. Um, so my role is I am the community, regional community development manager for Freeport. I've been with the company for 17 years. Uh, I didn't know about mining prior to starting with the company. And since then, I've been able to travel to our mines all over the world and um, literally, you know, go to the bottom of an open pit mine and look up and just kind of see what the um, amazing stuff is that happens there on a daily basis. Um, in the community development space, I uh, work with our team at our company. We have a whole team in our community development um, area, and we engage with the communities where we operate. Um, we uh, are a place-based industry. We are in community, and we are part of community, our employees, and our company. And uh, so that includes interacting with the community. We have regular uh, formal engagement with communities, and our um, team on the ground are informally engaging with our community partners all of the time. It also includes our social investment. So how do we give back in um, through you know, what we're able to earn as a company and how do we engage with communities to um, be there while we're mining and then also build the capacity and resiliency of those communities so that um, their strength, they become strengthened and they have the ability to live on much beyond us. And so um, I've through the social investment side, I've had the opportunity to partner with women in mining and be able to be the um, go-between with Freeport MacMoran and the women in mining um, chapter in Arizona. There, um, you'll hear a lot more about it from um, the rest of the panel, but women in mining is not just in Arizona. Um, we, there is a um, national organization, maybe even international, you guys will have to share. Um, but we are really glad to be a supporter of the Women in Mining Arizona chapter and the work that they're doing. Um, getting more women into the workforce and in the mining industry is a priority of our company and um, being able to partner with organizations that are um, supporting that and providing the um, opportunities to bring women together and provide resources and um, just build them up is uh, an important part of that. So figured it would be great to have them as part of this discussion today uh, because they're a part of um, making STEM rock too. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to Molly so she can um, introduce herself and the rest of her group. Sure, so I'm Molly Radwini. Um, I'm the secretary for the Women in Mining Arizona chapter. Um, so yeah, it's basically a nonprofit group. The chapter started only two years ago. Um, and there is a national organization that we're a part of. And really our purpose is just about increasing the visibility of women in this industry and providing support and networking opportunities for women. And we've also really expanded to try and include any underrepresented group. So we're really interested in bringing in you know, people from different backgrounds, maybe the, like other um, lower income or underrepresented groups into our organization. Um, Julia is the president and Maria is the vice president. Thank you all for joining us today. I think um, one of the cool things you mentioned, Angie, that not all people have experienced in why mining rocks is that you actually get to go down in the pit. So I had the opportunity to go down into the Bisbee mine with our students um, and had a bunch of engagements in with the um, geologists and free, uh, a bunch of individuals that worked with the mining. Um, and we also I also visited Baghdad, Arizona. So the idea of mm -hmm. the community involvement and you know how the organization, your company, really focuses on community was really powerful. So Molly, to hear you say you are looking to get underrepresented and, um, you know, groups into mining and understanding that there's a lot of different ways you could be part of mining, not only in Arizona, but around the world. So, you know, Julie, you want to tell us a little bit about you and, you know, why you're the president of that organization? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, started out in geology. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin with a degree in geology in history. Um, and then I got into engineering a little later. I've got a master's in engineering. I work for a, a local engineering firm here in Tucson called Colin Nicholas. Um, and I love mining. I love rocks. <laughs> I love geology. I've been, I've been lucky to work in this industry for about 10 years. And I am one of very few females um, at my company and in the industry in general, <clears throat> especially in the science and technical side of things. So um, I first joined WIM because I wanted to meet other women, come in contact with people in similar situations. And it's been a great experience. I've made really great friends, um, several of whom are on this call today, <laughs> and also managed to... Um, get involved in outreach activities I never would have known about without it. Um, and it's been really fun being a part of the leadership as well. We're not hearing you, Kelly, but just so you, so everyone knows when you hear um, us refer to WIM, uh, that is Women in Mining. So that's the acronym when you're hearing WIM. Thanks, yeah. Angie. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no easy problem. to forget that. <laughs> yeah. About now, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, we're just gonna go ahead and change mics. I get the big boom mic back. Okay. So, <laughs> what I was saying, um, we'll definitely come back to that role as a, a woman in a male dominant field. So we'll come back to that if we hear a little bit from Maria. What about you, Vice President? Madam yeah. Vice President. What, um, so I have you? a little bit of a different story. I am not a woman in a mine, but I am still a woman in mining. I actually work as a recruiter with Freeport. Like Angie, I did not know anything about mining when I got here, but I'm just in love with the industry and all it has to offer everything, you know, just the enormity of it and um, the vital resources that it provides to the world. Um, and so I actually work in college recruiting specifically. So I go out to universities and represent the company and try to encourage um, all students to really think about mining. And for a lot of them, even people who go to mine, uh, schools with mines in their name, you know, if you ask them, oh, have you considered a career in mining? They say, no, you know, I really haven't. Um, and so we're there to kind of tell them all the great opportunities that they can get um, from the mining industry. And so um, that's part of what drove me to join Women in Mining was just that um, I was especially noticing on campus talking to females um, that it was just 
really foreign to them the idea of coming and working in mining and you know what what does it have to offer them is it just going to be dirty and grimy and 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 they also have a very outdated view you know they see the pickaxe and the donkey they don't see the innovation behind mining so that's what we're there to do is to kind of um introduce them to mining in the 21st century um, and then I just love being a part of WIM like Julia said for the community uh, the people are great we've I have um, close to 200 members all across the state and all different um, pieces of the industry and corners of the industry so um, it's a great network it's a great community and, and it's just full of great people that's awesome yeah I think you know that's one of the big deals about STEM right the perception of STEM but mm -hmm. Angie, you alluded to perception and mining. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what are some of those perceptions? Maria mentioned the pickaxe and the donkey. Right. What are some of the things that have changed? Yeah, I think that um, over the years as we've done outreach and different things, I know I remember doing um, one time, you know, a teacher's outreach at the zoo and a teacher came to our um booth and said oh I didn't realize there was still mining in Arizona hmm. and you know that's a tough thing to hear <laughs> when you're working <laughs> you know I mean we had Arizona is one of the largest states with mining in the country and so um it shows that we have work to do um and I think it's an it, it helps you understand that um we can't make assumptions that just because we're in it every day and we understand the the vital need for the resources that are provided through mining. It's not, it, you know, it's not everyone's world, and they don't understand it, and it's not their fault for that. Um, and it, it it speaks to, you know, how do we play a role in that and making sure that they understand now, um, it isn't what you. Even, even you know, going to Bisbee and doing the underground mine tour there, a lot of what we, um, a lot of communities are so proud of their mining heritage, which is awesome. And you know, the stories and the, the people in our companies who are fifth, sixth generation miners, it, that's it's amazing. But I think even in those situations, helping people to understand that we have made so many improvements on processes since um you know how it used to be and hearing the stories and hearing how things used to be are it's those are great things to hear as long as we're also understanding the environmental responsibilities that are you know now part of the mining industry and you know i think along those lines it's interesting too because we hear things in the news about the epa being rolled back and all of these different um these different laws changing and you know less restrictions and that sort of thing and from a mining perspective it's important for us to communicate with our stakeholders that there might be some changes but these are still all of the things that we're following in order to effectively mine and do that in a responsible way so i think it's really around that responsibility piece um you know from an a from a Freeport perspective, there's so many things that we do that are voluntary, that are, you know, they're not things that are required of us in addition to doing all of the things that are required. And so I think there's, you know, some of that aspect of things. And then, you know, kind of relevant to the topic today is there used to be um, mindsets and, you know, I'm, maybe there still are that women didn't belong in mines, um, you know, particularly in underground. And I think that all of those things are, perceptions that could be out there that could still be around or because it's the only experience and exposure people have had is what they think mining is like today. Absolutely. And I think that's featured in, you know, TV shows or even movies that, you know, the perception that, you know, it's dangerous work, you know, myself, I served in the military for over 20 years and the idea that I wasn't supposed to be a female in combat. It's the same thing that, you know, do you really want your women going down to the base of the mine and maybe not returning for dinner. I think that was a perception and not that long ago. So the fact that you've been with the company for 17 years speaks to if you imagine when you first joined and not knowing much about mining, right? And to how respected you are now after 17 years. When we advocate for young women who want to pursue a STEM career, we need to be mindful of those perceptions because it might be their parents or their grandparents that are still 
you know, pretty powerful influencers of their future. So, Julie, I was looking at your background, right? So not only a geologist, which is not um, predominantly female career from, you know, 20 years ago, but also geotechnical engineer and 3D <laughs> block modeling. Tell me, what does that mean? So I spend, my specialty is working with data. I'm a, I'm a geostatistician, I guess you could say. Um, I look at, um, for mines like Baghdad, for example, where you've been, um, data collected from drill holes and the um, material properties of the ground. And then I, I take that information and I model it in three dimensions so that we can plan um, open pit mine slopes or underground mine design based on what we know from the data that we've collected. So that's, yeah. I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah, just say, a, I, I um, sat on a scholarship review for women in mining and Julia did a masterful job with all of this. And during the review, she had to pull up something to show us how people like kind of spell out. And this thing <laughs> showed up on her computer that was like, I mean, it was, talk about a foreign language. There were so many numbers <laughs> and so many sheets and so many layers. And it was just amazing. And I was just in awe of the fact that she had any idea what to do with any of it. So she, when she oh, thank you. <laughs> data, she does. <laughs> Either coding a Python script for something that you don't necessarily expect her to do that, or she'll make some crazy Excel sheet. And this is for, you know, for our nonprofit, just, yeah. or, you know, for the scholarship. <laughs> Well, and then well, the, the annual report, the, the, graphic design. The, the graphic design was done by Julia. So I think it speaks to the fact that Julia is a great example of what women bring to the table. And that generally is a wide skill set. We, you know, we, we a lot of times have to have a lot of balls in the air and juggle them and figure out how to do it. And that means having more than one thing that you can do well at and um, I think just that example right there is a, um, you know, that's, that's the value of having women in your workforce. Well, and I do think too, that what's funny is all of that is just kind of the result of my love of computers, which is the thing I didn't really discover until almost after college. So for me, I wasn't really, it just didn't seem like a thing that I could be good at or would be good at. And then in my job, I was given the opportunity to kind of be creative and solve problems my own way and suddenly I'm graphic designing on the side and you know Molly and I are working on Python scripts together you know during the day trying to, to troubleshoot stuff so um, part of the exciting thing about mining is there often isn't a right way to do things so you kind of have to because we're you know every place we go is somewhere new so we're always problem solving and thinking of new ways to do stuff and often that involves you know really cool computer science. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I don't think we can hear you. Oh, How about now. Yep. Now we got you. <laughs> How bizarre. She moved her mouse. I don't know what's happening. So I was looking to the fact that Maria probably has a bunch of people skills, right? If you're a college recruiter and going out and talking to students and really promoting what the company has to offer, I think yeah. that's important for people to understand. It's it's a package, right? Be well rounded learn how to communicate, learn how to be in social situations, but also yeah. have a passion, right? Julia, you love the computer and you've learned all these cool techie tricks. But Maria, what would you say to those students that are, you know, going to be applying yeah. well-rounded skills? So really what we look for in our internship program are those soft skills that you're talking about. We trust that the universities that we're recruiting from are giving them the technical knowledge that they need. You know, we know the U of A is always going to give us a great mining engineering student, a great civil engineering student, any of the STEMs, any of the business even. Um, and really what we're testing them on is can they communicate? Can they work on a team? Can they take direction? Can they think innovatively? And uh, you know, those are really the things that we're looking for in an intern um, because we use our internship as our pipeline to full-time employment. So we are hiring all of our entry-level talent through our internship program. Um, and so when I hear Julia talk about you know, how 
she has to think creatively in mining. Those are the kind of messages that we're trying to share with students is, you know, you're not going to just be stuck in a cubicle all day with a bunch of other engineers. You're going to be working with the operator. You're going to be working with the haul truck driver. You're going to be working with the senior engineer, with the health and safety department. It's very, it's a very social STEM industry, um, mm -hmm. unlike a lot of other STEM fields. Um, I don't think we can hear you again. Yeah, You're back. Okay, there we go. Okay. Now we hear you. You're back. I was just about to <laughs> wait for it. That's the word like, we, we can ad lib this. We can... Yeah. <laughs> we'll come up with questions in the next yeah, time. Yeah, there won't be a next time. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, I was um, asking Molly about being an intern and what that, how it feels as, you know, a young female pursuing a, my, um, a career in STEM and mining. And then, you know, what are some of the things you've learned as an intern? Um, I've learned a lot being an intern. I was actually an intern for Freeport for the spring semester. And now I'm an intern for Colin Nicholas, which is the company that Julia works for. Um, so it's really been great to get so many different experiences in the industry. And um, when I was working for Freeport, I was on a mine site and it was actually really fun and I loved it. I loved like being on the mine and just like getting dirty and getting up super early. Like it was just fun because you have a real sense of like purpose and camaraderie and like, you know, you know that you're doing something for a reason and everything's always changing. Um, so that was a really fun experience. And then since the summer, I've been working with Colin Nicholas and I've been doing pretty similar things as what Julia explained earlier with just working with the data. And that's been awesome too, because it really does bring out your creative side. Like you wouldn't think that it would because, you know, normally you think of working with data would be kind of just like plugging and chugging numbers, but there's a lot of, um, you know, working with imagery and working with software um, and even creating figures and stuff that actually does kind of use your creative side. And that's something I've never had before in other kinds of jobs. That's awesome. I think, can you hear, still hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. I'm going to ask that every time I start to talk about it. <laughs> Just the most unnerving show we've done, right? Like, I've had a lot of problems with my microphone. So um, that kind of brings me back to the importance of partnerships to lead change, right? And I really appreciate that you are all willing to get on the call today we have a partnership with Freeport and really promoting STEM in Arizona. Angie, can you talk a little bit about why that's so important for the company to really lead change? And as you mentioned, you know, promote Maria going out and talking about opportunities in mining. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, change can only happen if there's enough people at the table. It, it can't change we can't do change alone. And so the partnerships are critical for doing that. And I think there's so many different um, just phases of change and leading. And um, you have to have the people at the table at the right time to be able to bring their skill set and their, um, you know, what they can to the equation. Um, change is hard too. You know, you have people that don't want change, that don't want to see change. And, you know, when that's the case, you have to figure out how do you bring them along? Um, and you don't push them, you, you pull. And you have to have people that can have those skills to do it. I think, you know, one of the things that's sometimes, uh, is, you know, speaking as a, a non-technical person in a STEM field, I think sometimes it's hard because, um, you know, we don't have to have an engineering degree or it's not as um, you do this, this, and this. And, you know, that's not to say that 
everything that an engineer does or you know a, more of a technical person does is just scripted and you just follow these steps because that you know that's not the case but i think a lot of times when you're in a softer skill you know there's this belief that oh that's easy stuff you know there you don't need any sort of specific skill or ability to do that but i think when you talk about some of these things around um leading, bringing change, working with communities to build their resiliency, helping them to understand that, you know, what are some of the opportunities? What are the strengths that they have in their community? How do they come together to build upon those strengths? How, you know, which all does lead to change. Um, you know, there are skills that are required to do that. They might be a little different, but we need to be able to pull those out of everyone. And even if we only look at it internally from a, you know, a company perspective and how do we do that, how do we help the general manager at our operating site along with the environmental manager and you know, all of the different people who bring these different skills to the table together to partner to understand that this is an important aspect of what we're working on too. Yeah, I think, um... A few of you alluded to it in your guest form about why is it important for each of us to speak to that and have that opportunity for women in mining example at your organization why should the company have a space for females to gather and then be able to be at the table lisa you want to talk about that who did you do you what do you is there someone specific you ask or just any of us any of you anyone um i I have to say that, um, so I, my involvement with WIM was a huge part, and I can just speak to being an employee and also being in, you know, has bosses, you know, and works for a company, <laughs> um, that what I, my involvement in, in WIM is what got Colin Nicholas, my company, involved in WIM, and my bosses, like, once they had this, like, excuse to jump on board and, or this reason to get behind it, they really got into it and they volunteered on several of our, um, on several of our, um, for events, for scholarship, our scholarship judges committee, things like that. And that has meant so much to me personally, but I also know it's meant a lot to the other women um, at CNI. And I think the happier that your employees are and the more supported they feel, the easier it is to get more women or other underrepresented people to come work for you. And I also have to say that Freeport's been more so than any other company, extremely supportive of WIM, Angie personally as well. And Freeport is one of my biggest clients. And, and that, that's big too. That means a lot too, going to client sites, you know, and knowing that this company is on board. So I'm going to, I'm not, I'm going to feel, you know, comfortable as a woman in mining, you know, talking about my geostat or whatever it is you know so um i think it's really important um from that standpoint for sure yeah i think it's important too to understand the engineering aspect that angie alluded to and that it doesn't have to be that you're a female engineer you're an engineer and walking into a room and building that confidence and i know, you know that's what we're really trying to embody with our chief science officers and with all the students that we engage with that you don't have to be a female engineer. You can just be an engineer. And, right. you know, really identifying that when you're at the table, you are representing the engineer aspect and what needs to happen in the discussion or a working group. So leading that change, I really respect that you, you know, ask them to get involved and now they're wholeheartedly supporting it. I think that speaks volumes to your leadership. And, you know, knowing that you have the courage to say, hey, this is something I want to do as your employee, do you support me? And they did. That's, that's really excellent. So um, I think that's important for all of us to remember. We all have a voice. And, you know, the fact that we're all women on a call, STEM unplugged, talking about <laughs> mining and how STEM rocks speaks to where we've come, you know, in a long way in the nonprofit sector as well, is really identifying that, you know, we have an opportunity to engage with the public, let them know that there are opportunities for them to get involved. So, um, well, and Kelly, I think before we go to the next question, I just to add on about your your question around um, you know making space for women, and it's not an option anymore. It right. it, it has to happen, and um, you know just like the figuring out how to increase other underrepresented groups in in the workforce is not an option, and it it becomes you know somewhat challenging sometimes we're again we're a place-based industry 
And so we might be in communities where um, there's expectations of having a certain representation. And if we have a ben if our focus is on um, you know, hiring from a local community, balancing all of that out, but it just is, we have to make space. We have to make sure the space is safe and we have to figure out, again, it's that change piece of how do you bring folks on board who might not have the same um, feeling about it, but it's, it's not an option. Yeah, I think as we're all in different stages in our career, understanding that having those tough conversations with people who aren't really ready to listen is something we have to continue to strive for. So, you know, I, I even face it, you know, currently is this idea of let's make sure we're representing those that we serve and understanding that those we serve don't necessarily look at us and say, oh, that's me in 10 years. So mm -hmm. under, you know, all, you know, <laughs> getting rid of the niceties and really saying exactly what you said, Angie, it's no longer an option. Let's make sure we have, you know, everybody feeling like they can walk up to the table and participate. Mm -hmm. So. If oh, I ahead. could add to just from a recruiting perspective, you know, we, I talk to candidates every single day, anyone from a college student to a truck driver to a laborer. And, and, you know, when I, I think, you know, when we look at our, our demographic breakdown and like Angie said, the focus on hiring from the local communities, um, you know, sometimes it's hard because the local community does, you know, might lack that diversity perspective and, and for a hiring manager, you know, they're not, they're not acting out of malice when they hire the, you know, the local person um, over the person who might live in a couple states away, but is from an underrepresented population. They're just looking for someone who they're, they hope will stay, you know, and will, you know, will like the community um and so i think that part of what it is 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 a retention um part on the side of you know once we get them you know once we tell them all the great things about engineering and the mining industry and we get them to come here what can we do to make um all people feel comfortable there and feel like they can make a home there and a career there and and you feel like they want to stay um and so you know, I, I can go out to a college and, and recruit, you know, as many diverse candidates as possible, but in the end, um, what can we do in our communities and in our, with our employees mm -hmm. to make them feel like this is home for them? Right. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think really understanding too what I witnessed when I visited, you know, Baghdad, for example, that it was a sense of community when I drove into the town, like, you know, the, it was last summer, but the idea that 4th of July was going to be this huge community event, the whole town oh, yeah. was going. And, you know, I went and visited the community pool and all of the great aspects that were um, actually laid out in the entire community. It really took me back to living on base as a military individual. It's like, wow, mm -hmm. they have everything they need right here. And that's special because, you know, I grew up in a small town. And I'm going to ask you all, like, what do you do for fun? And, you know, how do you keep yourself, you know, contained, but safe and happy during quarantine, but really understanding that it really does mean something when you feel like you're part of a community, mm -hmm. you feel respected, you feel like it's safe, especially if you're going to have a family and children there. So retention is, is important because as you all know, it's not like 20, 30 years ago where people pick a career and stay in it. 20. Mm -hmm. So understanding that they can choose to leave, but you really do want them to stay, especially put, after putting that effort in. So um, yeah, what are you guys doing? How are you feeling? It, what does mining look like when you're not at the bottom of the pit? Like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> and anybody, a lot of this. <laughs> a lot of Zoom. Doing a lot of Zooming. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Zoom. <laughs> A lot of computer yeah. stuff. I mean, there's definitely people who are still working in the field and working in the mines. Um, and, you know, I worked in the mine just for like a couple of weeks after the quarantine kind of started. And, you know, it was, they have to adapt to some changes. I think, you know, Freeport kind of put in a few policies like only two people in a truck at one time and you know they were giving out hand sanitizer and all of that stuff so the people at sites I'm sure they're adapting to those kind of new rules and everything 
Um, and yeah, I'm just working from home. So <laughs> and the damper on the whole rock aspect, right? Like, yes. I haven't seen a rock in months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think within the mining industry, and I can only speak from a Freeport perspective, but safety is the number one value within our company. When you're driving a haul truck that is taller than a house, you, you know, you can't put safety less than top of the list of what we need to be focusing on. Absolutely. And so I think in some ways, adapting to COVID might've been easier in for some of the mine sites than in some of the industries where safety isn't something that's part of their culture and part of their DNA. Um, you know, I'm not saying that there wasn't a lot of thought put in it. We have a medical director who has uh, a ton of experience and has been able to guide the, the direction on what the company needed to do. And thankfully they acted quickly. Um, it hasn't been easy from some of the impacts. Um, I think, um, you know, we had a mine site that had some, thankfully of across our portfolio, um, we only had one, it would be better if it was none, that had um, any number of COVID exposures that it impacted the ability of the mine to operate. Um, you know, we did, we do have operations in South America and Peru and Chile had different ways that they managed the outbreak, um, Indonesia as well. And so um, just figuring out across that portfolio what needed to be done to keep both our employees and our community safe, because that's the way you lead. That's something that you have to do. And again, especially in a small town where you make up a lot of the, um, the, the people who live in a community, either through your employees or your contractors or whatever it might be, you have an obligation to do that. And um, you know, so it, it, it was, you know, what do we do for our employees? How do they take that home? You know, what are the different aspects that need to be put in place while still, I mean, we can't stop mining copper because then you can't build cars and you can't make solar panels and you can't do the things that the world needs to just continue to operate. Yeah, that actually leads me to my next question of, you know, why is copper so critical to the greener future? And you, know, you kind of mentioned, you know, some of the things, but touch on it a little bit more, Angie. What what is Arizona, you know, leading right now in copper mining? Right. I'll jump in, and you know, you guys, if you have more information. Um, but when you think about a um, a greener world, or the things that we look at for, um, you know, related to that, copper's in all of it. There's more copper in a electric vehicle than in a traditional vehicle. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things like that, that just continue to make, you know, continue to make copper more and more relevant. Um, you know, coppers, um, you can recycle copper endlessly. It's, you know, continuously recyclable, but there's not enough copper to be recycled to meet the demand that we would need to, for all the stuff that we need. And so I think, um, you know, that's an important message because, I mean, even if we think about it from the perspective of not how much copper's in um, more, more green technology, but people don't understand that copper is needed to turn on your light and to, you know, make your cell phone work and your computer work and, you know, all of that sort of thing. It's just such a like fundamental um, thing to just society in general. And as we look at that is there's some some countries that are um, you know, continuing to build out their infrastructure, that's an important need for copper as well um, as they're doing that sort of thing. So but I'll turn over to Julia and Molly and Maria if you guys have other specific um, copper uses. I was just gonna point out one of the other things that's big right now during COVID is copper's antimicrobial antimicrobial um, mm -hmm. properties as well. Um, it's it's one of the safest metals to be using when dealing with bacteria and germs. So you see hospitals start to say, hey, why do we have you know stainless steel door handles? Maybe we should change that to copper. Maybe these counters should be copper just to uh, reduce spread of, of viruses. Um, that was Julia. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> it is antimicrobial. <laughs> That's exactly, that's actually what I was going to say. It's a hot topic right now. Yeah, it's all the rage these days. 
Yeah, there's a lot of medical uses for it. But yeah, I mean, it's an excellent conductor. It's antimicrobial. Copper's in everything. Um, and copper byproducts are also very important, especially to um, green energy, like Angie already mentioned, solar panels, electric cars, need things like copper, cobalt, <clears throat> um, and other elements in order to, you know, um, for, the, for our country to continue trying to be as green as possible. Um, copper, copper is necessary. And I think Arizona is like the seventh largest copper producer in the world. If we were a country, just Arizona would be the seventh larger, largest. So it's a huge part of our economy. Um, a lot of the jobs in Arizona are um, copper based, you know, people working at mines or in producing and refining copper. Um, so it's a really big deal to um, the world, but especially to Arizona. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as we near the hour, I just really wanted to, you know, kind of ask you all for one more piece of advice, one more share out of, you know, not only do you, what do you enjoy about your career in mining, but what advice would you give to not only young females or even, you know, females looking to change their career, because that could happen as well. But what advice would you give to someone seeking an opportunity in mining? So... Is there anybody who'd like to start? We can, you know, toss it that way. But I want to give you that opportunity to really make your final call to action and a plea to our listeners and whoever's going to listen to the podcast after we're off the air. <laughs> but yeah, like, yeah. Well, okay. Lisa, you want to go first? Julia. Julia. Oh. Sorry. Julia. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> like, which one? I, I, think um, I, I was like, I think it's Lisa. Not, no, it's Julia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, no worries. <laughs> um, I not to plug whim, but honestly, I can't tell you how many yeah, um, opportunities I've been a part of connecting people to just because of my involvement in whim. So, like, a friend's looking for a job. I heard another friend that's involved in whim, but not just whim. Any organization, SME is another huge. Um, a professional organization in the mining industry. It's the Society of Mining Metallurgy. Oh, shoot. And exploration. exploration. And exploration. Thank you. <laughs> um, but getting involved in those kind of groups can really just up your exposure and help you get to know um, the people and make connections and also just learn about the industry. And um, I can't stress enough how, how important that is um, to finding opportunities. Um, I guess I would say like something that I talk to students a lot about is fine, you know, when they're out looking for their first job, you know, their first career is look for a company that that speaks to your values. Um, and that's one thing that I personally really like about working at Freeport is that I know where they stand on the environmental issues and the social justice issues and, and that they're really trying um, putting all their effort into being safe and um, producing copper responsibly. Um, I, you know, working at a mining company, it's, you know, maybe an inherently unsustainable, um, you know, industry. So what can we do to make that as sustainable as possible? And that's really the call to action that Freeport has really stepped up to the, to the plate for. So um, for students looking for jobs, you know, look on their website, you know, what do they say about diversity? What do they say about the environment? What are they spending in their communities? Um, and those are things that you should um, be thinking about when you're when you're committing to your first company. Excellent advice. Molly or Angie? Um, I guess I would say, you know, my advice kind of keep an open mind when you're thinking about your career. I think, I mean, I probably always wanted to do mining, but I think that for a long time I thought that I couldn't. Um, you know, that like I wasn't strong enough or that I wouldn't be able to do it because they're all in remote locations or something like that. And a lot of those assumptions that we kind of just tell ourselves are not necessarily true. Um, so definitely, I mean, that's why I think, you know, it's good to network and talk to people and to also just be able to see people who, you know, have something in common with you that you can figure out whether, oh yeah, actually, I guess I could do that. You know, like for, I remember for a long time, I would not apply to any like entry level geology jobs in mining because they all said you have to be able to lift 50 pounds. And I was like, 
I don't know if I can lift 50 pounds. <laughs> and then like one day I just was talking to this girl and she was like a fairly, you know, she wasn't like super buff. And so I was like, Hey, like, how'd you get this job? Can you lift 50 pounds? <laughs> she was like, yeah, like, of course. <laughs> like, I just, Molly, I feel like you're I couldn't. How much was your three-year-old way. <laughs> She only weighs How 30 pounds. Weigh? So. Oh, okay. <laughs> say. But yeah, so keep an open mind. Like, you're probably more capable than you think you are. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. And I think don't discount anything. Don't think I'm not, I can't do mining because I'm a woman or I can't do mining because of this. I think um, we do have to, if something is of interest to us, we have to we have to try for it. And I think that's something um, that people should just have an open mind about. And, you know, what is that? And don't limit yourself. Um, you know, I think Molly's story is, it, that's probably like a requirement that we have to put on the job description from some lawyer. And here we hear that it's potentially preventing somebody from wanting to apply for a job for us. And so <laughs> think about those systems and those processes and those things that are in place that might be, you know, keeping good people from joining in the good fight, you know, and when I applied, so this is 17 years ago, um, I, I applied in the company had, it wasn't Freeport at the time, it was our predecessor company, but they had an online process for screening folks. And so I submitted my information and I got a decline and I was like, oh, darn. And then I had found out the um, contact and had sent my resume directly. And um, she reached out and she's like, well, I want to interview you, but we have this online process. And I was like, yeah, I, I use that online process. I didn't know, was I supposed to tell her that I already was declined by the online process <laughs> Just say that I'd been part of the online process. So I think, and here I am 17 years later in the role right. and good at the role, you know, so they would have missed out if they wouldn't have, if they would have followed through the process. So <laughs> settle, I guess, is another part of it. If there's something that is, you know, what you want to do and it's, um, you know, you feel that it's the thing for you, then stick with it and figure out, okay, so if it's not the first time, find out, well, what was it that I need to strengthen and work on that and just, you know, stick with it and get, get to what it is you want to do. And I think everyone's kind of said it, you know, find advocates for you. I think especially for young people, find an advocate because there's lots of us out there and, you know, we don't know that you need it or you want it unless you ask. So figure out ways to do that. Absolutely. And don't be afraid of the no. Somebody said no, but you could have three yeses somewhere else. So right. Try again. Absolutely. Um, to our listeners, we encourage you to get involved in the STEM community. Maybe you're an industry professional seeking ways to make an impact, a student searching for a mentor, or a community collaborator hoping to meet the right people to help make it happen. We want to definitely share what's way, one way they can get in touch with you, Angie. Uh, my email, I can give them my email. It's aharman at f as in Freeport, m as in MacMoran, <laughs> i as in incorporated, dot com. <laughs> awesome. What about you, Molly? How can people get in touch with you? Um, people can definitely add me on LinkedIn and feel free to message me there if you're interested in getting involved in the mining industry. Um, my name's Molly Radwini, so you can find me on LinkedIn for sure. Perfect. What about you, Maria? Yeah, I'd say LinkedIn as well. I'm pretty active on there. Um, and I would also say if you're looking for um, an opportunity to work in the mining industry with Freeport, our website is fmjobs.com. Perfect. And Julia, not Lisa, Julia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, LinkedIn for me as well. I'm Julia Potter on LinkedIn. And then also, actually, if you email to Arizona chapter at womaninmining.us, go to Molly, Maria, and I. So yeah. <laughs> you can hit all three of us at once via email if you're interested in getting involved and uh, are knowing more about WIM. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I want to thank all of you for being on the call today. And you know, thank you for joining us on this episode of STEM Unplugged exploring ways to stem rocks. So we appreciate all of you for being on the show. And if you'd like more information, contact us at SciTechInstitute.org. This is your host, Kelly Green, and we would be glad to discuss how you can get connected.
Thank you for joining us for this episode of STEM Unplugged. We encourage you to get involved in the STEM community and stay connected at SciTechInstitute.org.